Right, we are recording and sitting up with sit me today, Thomas Turgo. Hello. Hello, mate. How's it going? All right. All right. Um, Good man. We finally got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been saying for a long time we should do something, haven't we? So. So we're here and we're going to talk records. But before we talk records, Tom, I want to know how you found the last sort of 10, 11 months, both as a human being and and as, as a creative, as an actor? Um, it's, it's been difficult as an actor um, because you feel very, like, useless in a way. Not to sound, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. I've got a lot of good family and friends around me, not obviously in the same household. Um, but, you know, I've got a lot of people that, that I trust and I can speak to every day and, you know, they sort of keep me sane. But, you know, not to sound very, very much not in a depressed way, but feeling very useless in the sense that it's difficult to get out of bed in the morning and think, shit, what can I do today? Like, what am I doing? Because, you know, there's only so many, you, you can sit and you can, you know, people say you can practice your accents or you can record monologues or you can do this and do that. You can't do that every day for 11 months. And it's kind of, it's difficult I mean, I'm very, I was very fortunate sort of through the first lockdown, I, I had a couple of jobs that was being released. Um, I had a film called Looted that was out sort of earlier on uh, towards the end of last year. And I was so busy with that sort of doing a lot of, you know, press stuff and podcasts and just sort of getting excited again. And, and, and that was sort of the highlight of it for me. Um, and, you know, recently, you know, a lot, a lot more scripts have been coming in. So I've been doing a lot of reading and, and things like that. Um, so as an actor, it's been tough. Um, but as a human, I mean, I'm very much a home bird anyway. I stay, obviously, being an actor, it's you can be away for six or seven months on a job. And, you know, as you get older, you know, you don't go out on the piss every night when you're, when you're working. As a kid, maybe when I was 17, 18, I was out a lot, socialising a lot. Whereas as an adult, you know, people don't want to do that. People have got kids that they need to FaceTime. And, you know, people are, are, are like myself are a bit more sort of I, I take my, my work more seriously now than I did when I was a kid so the idea of going out on the piss the day the day before I've got a, a big day at work it would I would never do that now so it kind of you sort of learn to be in your own company um so yeah as a, as a, as a, just as a person just as me as Tomo I've been all right and um I mean I spend a lot of time on Call of Duty at the moment I'm getting uh I've been getting really really good on Call of Duty um I managed to get my hands on one of the new Xboxes so um so I've just been you know it, it might sound a bit sad but I think without my Xbox I, I don't know what I'd have done you know I've spent a lot of time on that recently which I ne wouldn't necessarily be doing if I was working but it's yeah. kind of like I enjoy it now and it's kind of difficult because I'll sit on it throughout the day and then my wife Charlotte she's a, a nursery nurse so she's still working at the moment so when she gets home from work I'm a bit like I've got to peel myself away from battle and I'm a bit yeah. like, no, I've got to go, lads. Charlotte's home. It's one of them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but then you sort of come nine, ten o'clock, I'll be texting the lads. I'm like, right, it's game on. Let's go back to war. Um, so, yeah, I've been all right. I've been, I've sort of been, I've been plodding along. And I learned a lot about myself as well. You know, I've learned a lot about, you know, in, in the way, in the sense that spending a lot of time on your own, it can be, you can spend a lot of time in your own thoughts. So if you can sort of get those thoughts. You're comfortable, you're comfortable on your own. I am comfortable on my own, yeah. I mean, I am very much like an excited puppy. When Charlotte gets home from work, I'm, you know, sometimes, you know, before the Call of Duty days, I would be sitting and watching telly. And when I hear a car pull up on the front, I'm like a puppy. <laughs> like, Ooh, oh, Charlotte's home. Oh, let's do stuff. Let's go out and, out, you know, let's go for a walk or let's do this. And Charlotte's like, I've been at work all day, Tomo. I'm knackered. So it's kind of like... So I just went out and I want to be winding her up. So, but I mean, I clean the house. I, I cook a lot. Um, you know, just before I started this, I changed the washing and things like that. So I keep myself busy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've done, done a lot of growing up over the last sort of, like you say, 11 months. Has it been 11 months now? since Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so, but I mean, look, if you can't find the benefits in the bad, then, you know, that, that there's maybe problems there. But I think I, I'm one of them that no matter what, how bad the situation is, there is, there is, good there is always good to come out of the bad so yeah I've kind of um, managed to find that and uh, yeah I've been all right mate I've been all right good let's talk records Tomo yeah track one I'm going to ask you the song that you think's got the greatest ever intro well this was um I, I must say mate the questions are great as well they really got me thinking I mean because you sent them sort of earlier on and uh, I've been really sort of pondering over and there's so many different answers to every question 
Um, you can have some honourable mentions, mate. If you've got a few that you couldn't pick, then you can... Well, uh... the, well the first one, I, I really couldn't decide on one um, for many reasons. But the first one was um, the greatest intro that sort of gets me feeling like, wow, it was I Want to Be Adored by the Stone Roses for me. And the, the reason being is, I think it would have been about two, three years ago um, when the Stone Roses played the Etihad in Manchester. Um, me and all the lads went and it was one of them. We booked a hotel <clears throat> and we started early. So we was on the, we was in the Witherspoons by 11 o'clock. Um, and it was, you know, it was a full day sesh. And, uh, and you know, when you're on a big day sesh, when you've got all the gigs are going, but as soon as the Stone Roses came, and, and we were steaming, we were steaming, but as soon as the Roses came on, we just sort of like fixated on the stage and we was all just blown away by it. Um, and my mate Biff, um, Jack, uh, he got me on his shoulders just at the, the, the time when um, they started the instrumentals to I Want to Be Adored. And I remember just turning around and just seeing everyone just in this trance. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now. Just everyone was in this trance and there was smoke smoke bombs everywhere and every, the bucket hats everywhere and everyone was just, everyone was just in, in that same sort of mindset and that beautiful feeling that that created and just that and every you know when everyone's singing da, 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 yeah and it went mental and it was just uh it was just one of the best memories that i've ever it i say it all the time but whenever i go to a good gig i'm like i think that might have been up there with my best gig ever yeah but when people say to me what's the best live gig you've ever been to that's the the go-to um for me definitely i think it's just um just a, just the beautiful memories and just the colours of the smoke bombs and yeah just, yeah it was just beautiful. I heard somebody refer to uh, one of the sort of early Rosie's reunion shows as like the greatest karaoke crowd you could ever have been in. It said like oh. everybody was just bellowing every word to every song. Oh. And like they gone no gone. I was just just gonna say that they they create such an atmosphere at their gigs and everyone's so friendly and. I mean, it can sometimes for me, because the Stone Roses, the, the audience that This Is England attracted was very much the Stone Roses crowd. So, you know, there was probably an handful of people in that arena that hadn't seen This Is England. So for me, I, I just, I, you know, I had my hat on and I was just, so, and, and that's when I sort of, well, I, I always end up getting steaming because then I'm like, right, well, I can drown that out then. People staring at me, that's fine. Yeah. So then I'm steaming and I can enjoy it. But for some reason, at the Roses gigs, no one really, no one comes up and goes, oh, you know, the odd person will come up and have a photo, but, you know, people will just be buzzing and everyone's just buzzing just to have a good time. And I don't know what it is, but I've been to see the Roses loads of times. And every time it's just always been a friendly crowd and everyone's just sort of buzzing that, buzzing that I'm there, you know, in the mosh pits with them all and just having good fun. And yeah, so yeah, the Stone Roses have managed to create that sort of, or did manage to create that, um, sort of beautiful atmosphere and sort of almost like euphoric sort of feeling when when they're playing it's um it's beautiful so i mean you're you're, you're a young man tomo i'm i'm 47 i caught it first time round and yeah. and and it was magical then and i was you know blown away and i asked joe hartley this as well and, and obviously joe wasn't in as many scenes on that part as, as what you was like how did it feel to kind of get to almost experience that again on This Is England 90? Yeah, well, it was because of the way that Shane Meadows, who wrote and directed it, um, because of the way that he shoots, he's very much like if he wants to film, if he wants to shoot a party, he'll have a fucking party and yeah. there'll just be cameramen there. So it's it, we just managed to, we just have so much fun, man. Like he'll, he'll come up to us and he'll say, oh, there's a, you know, a room of 200 extras um, or background artists, sorry. Um, it'll, it we'll all be there and he'll come up and he'll say, oh, in the corner or in this little back room or if you go to the bar, you know, they'll give you whatever you want, drinks wise. And we just end up having a fucking massive session. <laughs> um, and it's it's the only job that I've ever been on where I've been at work and I've woke up hungover. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just a, the beautiful sort of feels it feels very real. Um, I mean, I would have loved to have caught the, the Roses the first time round. And also I would have loved to have been an extra, uh, not an extra. Um, I would have loved to have been like a crew member on Made of Stone that Shane yeah. Meadows made. Because I mean, and, and I know from speaking to Shane that that was a boy, a dream job for him. Yeah. Like just getting to fly around the world with, with the people who he's grown up listening to. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, it's just uh, just managed to create some beautiful memories on 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 the set of that, particularly with the, you know, the sort of parties and rave scenes that we shot, and yeah. So how did you discover the Rosies? The first time, the first time, Ian Brown was on set of This Is England because he was. Oh, an extra. He was on eighty six, wasn't he? Or eighty eight, yeah, wasn't he? he? Yeah, he, he was an. Uh, he played a police officer. I keep saying extra. I'm sorry. Um, he was a, a background artist on uh, eighty six. He played a police officer um, during the big fight scene, and everyone, particularly Joe Gilgan, who played Woody, he was he lost his shit. <laughs> like, I, I've never seen Joe Gilgan like that because. Joe's very much the alpha male of the, the, the leader of our gang uh, when we're on set. You know, we all look up to Joe, he, you know, out of work as well. And when I saw Joe sort of talking to Ian Brown, I was like, what, what are you doing, Joe? And I was like, because <laughs> obviously I'd heard of the Stone Roses, but I'd never, I'd never really, and I'd, I knew a few of the songs, but I was not really as fixated as I am now which Ian probably loved, you know, and, and, and Ian was staying in our flats with us and we had such a good time just chilling and we was all play fighting. We we all had this thing where on, on This Is England 86, we would all play fight to the point where it sometimes got a bit serious. We'd all just be messing around. And I remember Ian was in, I think it might have been Woody's flat and he was just in a corner of a big spliff on and he was like, I think he must have been looking going, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> just kicking shit out of each other. Um, so that was the first sort of, that was the, the first meeting with with the Stone Roses. And then Ian then invited us to go to Heaton Park when the, he did a show of his own. Um, it might have been for... Um, there's a festival in Manchester at Heaton Park. What's the festival called? It's quite a big one. Is it Park Life? Did they do that at Heaton Park? Yeah. We might have gone there. So Ian it, it took us all along with him to, to one of his gigs. And I, again, it was one of them I just saw. And when he did um, Fear, F-E-A-R, I remember just thinking... and. And um, one of the lads had said to me, you know, he explained the, the meaning of F-E-R and how every sort of beginning of every um, uh, lyric is F-E-A-R, fear. Um, and I remember thinking, that's fucking genius, that. The yeah. whole song and just uh, the crowd. And I think the crowds are the main things for me, particularly with Rose's gigs. Um, they're just such a, it's just so euphoric. Um, but that was sort of the, the first time that I'd seen Ian Brown because obviously that you know Manny and the rest of them wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and from then on, I was just sort of it was one of them that you just put it on in the car whilst you're driving, and um, yeah, man, it's it's I, I sort of go in, fo- in in phases with the Stone Roses. I'm not listening to them for a long time, and then I'll put them on in the car. And again, just going back to the intro, when that intro of I want to be, or, or even or like you know when Waterfall or. The intros are Sally Cinnamon. Mm. The intros just get you straight away. And when you're driving, it's like, I go away from myself. And I'm almost like, you, you know, you do that thing when when you was a kid and you'd have your earphones in and you was, you'd was you pretend you was in a music video. Yeah. So it's almost like that. You, you're sort of just driving along. Sorry, Joe, you're only allowed to do that when you're a kid. Mate, I oh, do well, that they, every day, man. Well, I'm, you know. I am Richard Ashcroft every time I'm walking down the yes, street with mate. my headphones yeah, exactly. on. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that's sort, of, that sort of feeling. And it's like for, for, for artists to be able to get their fans to take themselves to that place every time. Having not listened, you know, I have been listening to them for a long time. It's I think it's a real talent. Um, and it just shows what what their music means to people. You know, it's not just noise in the ears, it's it's very much it grabs you in a way that you know very few artists have managed to create. And I, you know, I guess it's different for other people, but I guess I've just got a lot of affiliation with with the Stone Roses and you know, I've had a spliff of Ian Brown, so. What more <laughs> do you want out of life? I was about to say that not many people can say that they've done that, but I bet there's fucking thousands. Of <laughs> <laughs> and this is very much when I was a kid as well, by the way. I don't do that any of that anymore. <laughs> well, well, let's let's go back to uh, to, to you as a, as a kid. And for track two, Tom, I'm going to ask you the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Um, this one, um, straight away. So me and it came to me very quickly. This one, I, me and my dad, we flew to Rome when I was fourteen. Um, my mum had passed away, and I didn't live with my dad. Um, my mum was on set with us filming all the way through. This is England. Um, she passed away at the uh, before it was released. So I moved in with my dad, and I've never. I knew my dad, but I never was never really close with him. So it was a weird territory. I was in this in this house with him that. You know, I didn't really know him that well. And then I, Shane, it was for the, uh, was it, it was for the Rome Film Festival. Um, 
me and my dad flew over to to Rome and I'd never seen I'd not seen this is England. My dad didn't really know much about it. He knew that I was that I'd done this film and he never really knew what it was or you know who was involved or the impact it was going to have on so many people's lives. Um, and at the end of the film, Shane Meadows never told me that he dedicated it to my mum. So at the end, it's, it pops up at the end that um, in loving memory of Sharon Tegus, who's obviously my mum. And over the back of that, of the credits and the, the last scene of This Is England, um, Clay Hill covered a version of the Smiths, please, please, please let me get what I want. Um, and when that popped up at the end, um, that it was dedicated to my mum and we got and this is no word of a lie a, a, a 25 30 minute standing ovation in Rome in a theatre of probably six seven hundred Italian people and I was like and it blew me away and it's the first time that I really remember having a proper hug with my dad and it was like and he and he, and he said to me I'm so proud of you mate and yeah, it was just that 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 sort of emotion that that we got from that, and I can. It was almost like in slow motion, you know, turning around and there's all these people, you know, clapping, and and it was just it was one of the most beautiful moments that I've ever had and ever will have. Um, so yeah, that 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 song really does mean a lot to me, and every time I hear that song, it takes me back to that memory as clear as day. So, yeah. Tom, I don't think anyone's answered that question any more beautifully than that, mate. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh mate. Yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm just, uh, and it makes me really, really appreciate it. And, and, you know, it's, I think it was just the most beautiful gesture from Shane to do that, to dedicate the film to my mum. Yeah, because she never got to saw that, she never got to see the final product. So he knew how much that would mean to me. So, yeah. So if you are listening, Shane, thank you. And so, and so where was uh, home? Uh, in those early days, where did you grow up? I grew up in Grimsby. Um, we, my mum was a single mum, and we sort of moved around the town. Um, you know, we lived in a lot of the rougher areas of the town because my mum, she she never worked, so you know we never really had much money. So we was in a lot of council houses. So just the two of you? I know this... there was me and my eldest brother Carl. Um, so we would sort of, excuse me. So we moved around and we spent spent time on on the Gilby estate. Then we was on the Yarborough. Then we was on the Nunsthorpe. And so all of the sort of rougher areas of Grimsby. Um, so yeah, we sort of spent a lot of time moving around. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, the, the, so I was sort of brought up all over the town really. So even now when I walk, you know, people say, oh, these estates are really bad. Like, you know, the Nunsthorpe's bad or da, da, da. I'm really lucky because I moved around them a lot when I was a kid. So I know most of the people around there, not so much anymore because yeah. the people who was feared back then, they're all older now. So you know what it's like nowadays, the kids are on the streets, don't they? So yeah. yeah, but you know, everyone always said, oh, you know, probably wouldn't walk around there, but I always felt safe all over the town. So yeah, um, and that's where Shane Meadows and Des Hamilton, who cast the film, um, discovered me um, on the East Marsh estate. So yeah, that's where, uh, that's where it all started. <laughs> Well, let's stay in them formative years for, for track three, Tomo. And the song that reminds you of your time at school, please. Well, I never really went to school. <laughs> <laughs> I never really went. Um, but these, there was... Um... Right, hang on. You never went to school, right? So there's two reasons. You was acting or you just fucked it off? I just off. couldn't be asked a lot of the time. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, for the first sort of three years of school, I was so busy. I was I obviously I'd made This Is England when I was 14. Um, fortunate enough, fortunate enough to travel around the world and sort of, you know, go to all these beautiful places with the film and the festivals and whatnot. Um, so I never really spent that much time in school, and then I was I was pretty much non-stop work. Um, and then I got to fifth. I mean, I, I went I went back for the last two years, last year, and did my GCSEs. Um, and that's when I felt at my most normal. You know, I got I, I got a girlfriend. Um, pretty quickly when I was in school, um, who I, w I was with for four years. Um, so I sort of had this very normal sort of school life. You know, no, no one really in the school really cared about what I did. Every, you know, I had a, I had a lot of friends. Um, did, you find I, that, did you find that grinding, Tomo? Yeah, definitely. And it's what I needed. I needed, I needed uh, you know, my family. And in particular, I mean, 
look, I, I'm not going to sit and talk about my ex-girlfriend because I'm happily married now. But, you know, my ex-girlfriend's family, I'll always remember her dad. You know, he was so brutal with me a lot of the time. And I don't know, I don't know what it was, but something about him, he was always, he always used to say this thing, keep your hands in your pockets and keep whistling. You know, whenever I was around the house, I don't know what he meant by it, but just little things like that, uh, you know, and the way that my dad was with me and the way that all my friends were, were with, with me, because, you know, if I, if I was out with my friends and I was talking about myself all the time and talking about work, they'd very quickly tell me to shut up because I was boring them. Yeah. And that's exactly what I needed. Um, but I remember I bought an iPod not long after I moved in with my dad. Um, and I used to have it on all the time. It was one of those little iPod nanos. Um, and I had it on all the time. And the song that always used to come on was, um, you'll have to forgive me if I pronounce it wrong, but it was Sandy Tom or Sandy Thom, the I Wish I Was a Punk Rocker. Yeah. You remember, you know which song I'm on yeah, about? Yeah, 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 I yeah. I Wish I Was a Punk Rocker. I won't sing it because I'll ruin the song. But for some reason, that was the first song that came to my head because... I used to I used to go on my bike to school my 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 iPod on and just I don't know I I remember it's one of them songs as well that when you put it on very loudly you can sing at the top of your voice and it almost feels like you're a good singer or you think oh, it's never the case mate it's never no, the case no because if you turn it off halfway <laughs> through you realize that you've got a terrible voice but um for some reason I God knows I must have been biking past people in the morning on the way to school with my my iPod on full blast singing. And they must have just been like, Christ, that kid's quite happy, isn't he? <laughs> but yeah, for some reason. And then every time it pops up, you know, it popped up last night, actually. Um, it pops up on, uh, on Shuffle on my, uh, on my, on Spotify. And uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's just, uh, it just, it just takes me back to biking to school when I was a kid. Um, and it's a pretty cool song. I quite like it. And so I normally ask um, guests what they wanted to be when they were at school, but you was kind of doing it when you was at school, right? Yeah, but I wasn't sure it's what I wanted to do. Really? Mm. I mean, look, it's it's no secret that the only reason I did this is England was because I got told that I'd get paid money for it because I was thirteen year old kid and I, all I wanted was all I wanted was money to you know to to treat my mom and buy my friends Chinese food and you know buy a little crosser things like that um, and that very quickly changed, you know, I, I, after I'd finished This Is England and I went straight onto another job with Stephen Graham, um, which got cancelled after three episodes, I think it's called The Innocence Project um, on BBC. Um, and then I then went on to do more and more. And the more that I, the more and more time that I spent on set with people like Stephen Graham, um, who's taught me so much, not only, you know, in my personal life, but in you know, the ways to, to put yourself out there on screen when you're doing your interviews, your podcast and things like that. Um, I very quickly learned that if you're in the game for the money, then, you know, you, you, you need to really care for the characters that you play in. And, and that's always what I've done. You know, if I, if I, if I'm playing a character that's, you know, going through a lot in, in, in it, going through a lot emotionally, I really take myself to a very emotional place in my own personal life. So, you know, it's kind of like you've really, and, and to do that, you've really got to care about it because if you don't, if you take yourself to emotional places when you don't necessarily have to, you can really start to sort of get in your own head a lot. And it's about finding that fine line between doing it for the character to make it believable, but also you need to look after yourself because you know, some of the things that I think about and, and, and the places that I take myself to in order to get the emotions, as soon as they say cut, I don't just stop. That doesn't, the emotions don't switch off. You know, I, I'll go back to the, to the, the accommodation at night and, and sometimes it, it really sort of starts, it can really take a toll on you. So, yeah, you sort of like, and, and, and it was at that point where I really realised that, you know, I really, really do care about my job and I care about what I want to do. So I was very fortunate that I did learn that quite young, but sort of during This Is England, the film, I never really, I never wanted to be an actor. I just sort of, yeah, I just wanted to sort of get it done and, and get my money really. But as, when they said, and that's a wrap for the final scene that we shot and we had the wrap party and then I realised, I thought, God, I'm never going to see these people again. They've taught me so much and... They've, they've become my family. 
And I thought, I'm never going to see these people again. And it was, it was then, and I just thought, fucking hell, man, I want to do everything I can to make sure that every job that I do is special and it means something to me. So, because money, you, money comes and goes, you know, you spend it on shit and the, 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 the relationships and, and the friends that you can make and, and the relationships that you, you know, you, you very, very quickly create when you're on set is priceless. So, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you see so many people, you know, when they're accepting awards or doing, you know, press junkets and stuff saying, oh, it was, it was great on set, you know, we're just one family. And, and half the time, the sceptic in me is always like, bollocks. <laughs> but when I see the relationship from the cast of This Is England, mm. you can tell there's something special there. Oh, it's just, like... just, just from my armchair looking in, I just think that there's, there's something special there. Yeah, it really is, and it's. Um, I've I've recently just rewatched um, the This Is England series. I've not seen them since it was on TV, so very very long time ago. Um, and it just brought back so many beauty. I was texting Shane, um, Shane about it, just saying like, and again, not that I have to because he knows how appreciative I am, but just thanking him for the memories that we've had and the friends that we've, you know, the the the, the love that we've all got for each other. I mean. Going back to Call of Duty, I'm on, you know, in, in our little clan, we've got, uh, there's me and Andy Ellis who plays Gadget. Oh, you know Andy anyway. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm on Call of Duty every night with Andy Ellis and I speak to Vicky McClaw most days and Stephen Graham most days and um, I FaceTime Michael Soccer for probably two hours of every day. Um, so these people aren't just people that I work with or have worked with. These are people that, I love to bits, you know, they was very much at the top of my list when me and my wife, Charlotte, when we was writing our list of people that we want to be there, they was very much at the top of that. Um, and it's so bizarre to think because you work with people, you go and you, you spend so much time with people um, when you're on set and you, you've, you're forced to have a, a relationship almost with these people because you know, I, I I was on a job last year, not last year, the, the year before. I was in Manchester for seven months. And I saw Charlotte probably 10 times in seven months. But every single day I woke up and I was with these people who I never knew before the job. And it's sort of like these people become your life. They're, your, you're spending every day with these people. So it's kind of like it can be very, it can be very stressful in, in a sense that, you know, you 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 you're forced to sort of build a a lifetime of 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 relationships and trust with these people in a very short amount of time whereas with this is england it just happened we become this gang very very quickly and that's what shane very cleverly sort of you know manipulated in a way that when we had time at the beginning of shooting we we there was rehearsal times and by rehearsal we mean we went to alton towers and we went to the arcades and we went bowling and we did, and we lived together, and we did all these things that friends do. And very quickly, that's when it just sort of, yeah, it just happened. It just happened that we was all, we was all, we was all meant to meet. That's that, that's the funny thing is, there's, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in the people who walk, or come into your lives at the right time, and those people, you know, God knows what I'd been doing if I didn't know all them people, and God knows what I'd have been doing if all those people didn't promise me that they would stay in touch with me and have me in their lives because. Well, I, I I don't know what I'd be doing if you know, I went I, I, as soon as we finished filming. One of the first things I was doing is going down and staying with Stephen Graham and his family. You know, and most weekends I was with them every every weekend. And um, yeah, just uh, I don't know what I'd have done if I didn't have that relationship with those people. What was the first record you bought, Tomo? The first record I ever bought. Um, it was uh. It was an album for my mum when I got paid from This Is England. Uh, I know it wasn't even my pay. It was my per, die, per, per, die, per diems. My per diems, basically my living costs, my, to buy food and things for the, for the accommodation that I was staying in. I think it was like £70 a week or something, um, which as a kid, I was like, fucking hell, I'm rich. <laughs> um, and my mum was obsessed with Robbie Williams. She loved Robbie Williams. Um, Angels was the song that was played at my mum's funeral. Um, but going back to, to the first album that I bought was um, Robbie Williams. It was it, it was a escapology. 
It was one of one of his early albums. I think it might have been 2002 or three. It was released. Yeah. Um. So I would have I would have done the film in 2005. So it was a couple of years old. But I remember going to HMV when I got my money and coming back to Grimsby for the first weekend. And I was like, the first thing I'm going to do is treat my mum. So I went into town and uh, I bought a Robbie Williams escapology. And even now, listening back to, he's another one, Robbie Williams. I can put him on in the car and I, I, I love him. I think he's brilliant. I've been to, my, my friend, bless him, got me some tickets to go see him for the first time. Um, would have been maybe my 22nd birthday. I made my 23rd birthday and he, he bought me and Charlotte some tickets to go and see him in Manchester. But then it just so happens that we went to the one love concert, you know, for the, yeah. the attack on the, uh, the arena. Um, and then we, so we was in Manchester watching Robbie Williams on the Friday. Um, and then we went on the Saturday to the one love thing and Robbie Williams was there again. So I'd never seen him always sort of wanted to, to sort of, to sort of, I don't know. You sort of, I, I, when I was watching him, I was thinking about my mom and thinking about how she would have lost her shit if she was here. So yeah, it was kind of nice. And then I, I kind of got, I got to do that twice in two days. So yeah, it kind of, um, it all worked out really well, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah. Robbie Williams was the first album that I ever bought But for myself, for myself, I reckon the first one, the first one that comes to mind would have probably been Eminem curtain call the deluxe edition me and my brother used to sit in um in 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 our bedroom playing fifa and uh my brother used to know every word to every single song on that album and i remember just thinking jesus christ that's amazing i was really impressed by it <laughs> uh, but again even even with um even with the you know the curtain call album I, I i put that on now and i still enjoy it as much as i did the first time and now i know all the words to it so yeah <laughs> in regards to records and and you know and, and being at home with uh you know your mum and your brother growing up was was there always music on at home yeah but my mum's music taste was um she loved happy hardcore nice she was very much happy hardcore like field of dreams and shooting star and all that sort of thing and uh scooter i remember like scooter was always on in our house when we was kids um and uh, yeah, I, I mean, that sort of music always gets me going. I always think happy hardcore, no matter how old I am, I will always love that. I'll yeah. always put it on in the car. And Charlotte, who never listened to it when she was a kid, Charlotte's like, oh, what is this shit? Whereas me, I'm like, <laughs> I love this. I love this music. Um, but yeah, uh, so my mum was very much into that sort of thing. Um, so that was always on. But then when I moved in with my dad, my dad was very much the Stone Roses, Oasis, um blur um madness new order all that's um uh, happy mondays and um and all that sorts of things so i've very i've got a very very like if you press shuffle on my spotify oh god knows what would come up it could yeah. be anything it could go from miley cyrus to scooter to oasis to, to anybody it's sort of very random which is why it's dangerous when i'm djing after a drink because if I'm DJing when I've had a drink, I sort of like, I get to that point where I'm like, I put a tune on and I'm like, I fucking love this. I love it. I'm not bothered if them out there are enjoying this because I'm enjoying this. So yeah, so sometimes the, uh, and Andy Ellis is the same. Sometimes when we're DJing, we can throw something on. And Andrew Shim's a nightmare for it. Um, sometimes when we're DJing, we can sort of, we we have to remind ourselves that people have paid to come see us. So maybe we need to stick to to what's on the posters instead of, you know, that's that's the thing, Tom. I mean, I I, I run a club, um, and and you know, I've been a DJ for 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 donkey's years. And if you ever have a beer, that's when you get that little thing in your head, which is, I know what they're like. Yeah. And when you have that, it's certainly not anything they're gonna fucking like. I can no, promise no, you that. It's no. like it's so dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> it's so dangerous. But then, like, and DJ crushing as well, crushing Sorry. when you actually press play. And then you just get this kind of bewildered mass of people just, what yeah. the fuck's this? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But then I think a lot of the time, you know, if, if you're DJing and if the DJ's having fun, you can sort of, you know, we can we can get the crowd going and stuff. But um, it's it's funny, actually, with the DJing because the first time I ever did it, um, Vicky McClure was supposed to do one in Leeds and she, she couldn't do it. And she said, do you want to go to Leeds and DJ? And I was like, I was working in a pub at this time and um, in my local pub. I was actually on shift when she rang me and I was like, I've never DJed before Vic. She was like, it's fine. Just turn up, 
you know, tell them what songs they want. They'll know that you're not a DJ, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I got, and they said, oh, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll pay you. They'll give you all your drinks. They'll put you and your friends up in a hotel. I was like, yeah, I can do that. I, yeah, this sounds <laughs> better than you. So off we went, me and a few of my mates to Leeds. Um, and we had the best night ever. It was honestly, you know, he's getting bottles of vodka bought over. There's, you know, everyone wanted to be part of it. It was brilliant. And, um, and then very slowly but surely I started, you know, started asking questions very much like I do on set when I'm when I'm filming. I'm like, what does this do or what does that do? Or da, da, da. And then very slowly but surely, you know, I started picking things up and then very quickly I was able to, you know, hold a, a, an hour set on my own. And then and then very quickly, I, you know, I could now you could you could leave me on the DJ decks and I could be there all night if you wanted me to, because. I've sort of learned very much about crowd control as well. You know, it's until have you like I'm assuming you've DJed sober. It's very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. It's so weird, like because w- one of the other things that I'd done was I I took up I'm I'm friends with the guy that plays Jane in between us. Oh um, right, is um what's his James? Name? James, uh, yeah, yeah, James. And so He's brilliant. I got James at DJ. And I was like, let's go and do this. Probably the same circuit that that that, that you and and Shimmy yeah. and that were doing. And very much oh, like yeah, you, yeah, first yeah, of all, I was kind of playing records for him and doing it. And then he'd be like, what's that? And then before you know it, he'd be like, oh, you're sitting at the back of the booth and he kind yeah. of got to grips with it. And... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. It is very much, but it's addictive, man. But we, there was a time, I think it was when This Is England 90 came on, there was a time when we did um, almost like a little mini tour around the UK and... Uh, you know, we was in Leeds on Tuesday and then we was in Bath on Wednesday and then we was in Scotland on Thursday and then Wales on Friday. And it was like, it's just drinking every night. And it got to the point where I was, I was fucked. And I was like, I can't do this anymore because, you know, it's, it's not the same for me when I'm sober. Even if I'm just having a couple, it just, it's very much like, I, I just like to sort of get the feel for it. And, and I like to enjoy it myself as well. That's part of it. And I always said, once, once I stop enjoying it, that's maybe when I'll stop doing it because I'm not a DJ. I know that. Um, but once I stop enjoying it, maybe I'll, you know, cut back doing it a little bit. But now I've not done it for, well, well over a year for obvious reasons. I miss it, man. I miss it. But yeah, it's, um, it's, such, a, it's such a good feeling doing the DJ and it's, it's good fun. Well, that leads us on perfectly uh, to track five, Tomo, which is mm. the song that soundtrack your years clubbing. Well, this, I sort of had two, I sort of had a massive change when I turned, to, mainly from the DJing, really, um, sort of from 18 to maybe 21. I was very, I, I used to love flares and reflex. You know, the, the 80s, 90s mm. bars. So we had one in Cleethorpes. So I was very much in, in their most weekends. So any like you know the Whitney Houston's or the Queen and Abba and all that. So any of those sorts of things really used to get me excited. And you know I, I used to you, when Bohemian Rhapsody came on. I mean you was you was in a trance, weren't you? But then I started DJing, and for obvious reasons, my sort of crowd that I would attract for a DJ set may not be into that sort of music. So I, I sort of really had to learn not learn because I did like it anyway, but very much like Jamie T and the Kaiser Chiefs and you know, the Killers and Stone Roses and Oasis and all. So I very much had to, um, I very much had to adapt my music to what other people wanted. Um, so I think, I think Seven Nation Army for me now, you know, if I went out and Seven Nation Army came on now, that would be me, you know, beeline straight for the dance floor. Um, yeah. Because that's always, that's always a safe one. Going back to what we were saying, if you put a song on that the crowd aren't necessarily enjoying during a DJ set, you line Seven Nation Army up, you know your sound after that. They're going to forget about the the, yeah. the the shit you've just played because they're very much, they get lost in that. And it's yeah. so good, particularly when you do festivals. Say if you go to Kendall Calling or Leeds and Reading and you can get that, like, you get on the mic and you can start getting them. The amount of times I've been bollocked for getting mosh pits going is <laughs> Um, the one being, I, I did a silent disco at, um, it was in Reading for Leeds and Reading Festival. And I, it was the most, there's a video of it somewhere. I can't remember. I think my brother took it because he was there with me. And it was the most insane. But whilst I'm getting this mosh pit going, I'm sort of thinking, I'd fucking love to be in there. I'm up here. I'd fucking love to be in the middle of that. 
Um, so I think, yeah, Seven Nation Army is very much like a, a soundtrack of my clubbing, clubbing years. But then there's the like, also, I think things like, even Rihanna, we found love. Anything yeah. like Nicki Minaj. Because sort of when I was 18, 19, I was into that sort of very, I sort of followed the crowd really. So we'd go into places like the bootlegger in Cleethorpes and I sort of just followed the crowd really. And and that was the, sort of, there must've been times when, I don't know, Pitbull must've come on and I'm like, right, I'm having a bit of that. I'm straight to the pole. Do you like a dance? Sorry? Do you like a dance? A dance, no. But uh, jump around with my arms around people that I don't know and sort of singing. I, I love a sing along. I'm a yeah. massive fan of a sing along. So I always try and sort of end my DJ sets with very much like um, Sally Cinnamon and then a Wonder Wall or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I do love a sing along. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not really like a wedding dancer as such. Yeah. I like to go a bit nuts. I like to get sweaty. Maybe, well, I did. I don't know. I haven't, I've not been in, in a club for so long. I don't know. I don't know what's happening now. Well, I'm going to take you home now. And for track six, a favourite song from your home county, please. I'm from Grimsby, so there's not really much. I mean, so Bernie Torpin was... Okay. So he was from Sleaford, which is Lincolnshire. So Grimsby's northeast Lincolnshire. So, I, I mean, this was a tough one. I mean, Bernie Torpin, for obvious reasons, you know, I learned more about him having watched Rocket Man with Taryn Edgerton. Um, and I didn't realise how involved in Elton John's life he was in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, we wrote a lot of his music for him. Um, so, I mean, th there was the, the, that, that was a ve very obvious one for me. But also there's a, there's a girl from Grimsby that I'm assuming a lot of people and the listeners wouldn't have heard of, but she's a girl, believe it or not, she's called Eden Lake. Really? She's called Eden Lake, which is one of a very early film that I made. It's a um, fucking a terrifying film as well, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I remember, I think one of my friends was seeing her at one point and, um, and he said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm seeing this girl called Eden Lake. And I was like, Eden Lake? I'm like, surely not. And then um, Grimsby is a very small place. She plays live in one of our local places, um, Bobbin in Cleethorpes. Um, and I went and watched her and, we, you know, I, I spoke to her a bit and we've we become really good friends. And she's got the most incredible voice. Um, so much so she she came and played at our wedding, bless her. Um, me and Charlotte got married on New Year's Eve two years ago. Um, and she came along and she's just got the most incredible voice. And she's got this song called Bad, Bad Man. Um, and it just really, ex I think I just her voice is really ad addictive and it's sort of like, just kind of really drags you in. She's got this sort of like husky tone. Um, so anything that she sort of covers or anything like that, she's on Instagram and things. Um, but yeah, she's really, really, she's got such a great voice, but it's sort of a tough one for Grimsby because there isn't many people who have sort of made it in a sense that, you know, a lot of people will know. But how surreal that the one that does it's got the same name as a film using that's that's mad. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Yeah, so it's yeah, th there's um... that's a great film, Tomo. It's a really good film, that man. And oh, it was thanks, like, mate. and it was like it's it's really weird. I'm not a big fan of horror films, and I watched that and I was like, that is terrifying. Yeah, 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 it is. It's sort of because it's it was so close to to reality as well, wasn't it? In a sense yeah. that you know, you get all these kids that you know that will be knocking around on street corners or in the woods or whatever that you know the unpredictability of kids particularly nowadays I think it's um you know it'll, it'll ring a lot of truth to, to kids nowadays and again we never really I, I well personally I never knew the the sort of effect that that would have had that that did have on people um I think that was the second it was the second feature film that I'd ever made um so again I was very naive in a way that I was very much just there sort of learning my craft and um, and just learning so much day by day. It was um, it was a great experience. It was fucking cold. We was filming in um, Black Park behind um, Pinewood Studios in Slough. And uh, I remember thinking, yeah, Jesus, we did a lot of night shoots. It was freezing. Um, and as a kid, I'm like miserable about it. I'm like, this is fucking bullshit. It's fucking freezing. Why are we working? It's freezing. Whereas now you're working because you're getting paid, mate. Um, but yeah, no, that was, um, it was a good experience, that. It was good. I've not seen it for a long time. Before I ask the 
for the last track, uh, mm. Tom, uh, um, I just want to ask one. I just want to ask you something. I, I um I interviewed uh, Helen Bean. Um, ah, yeah, uh, oh, she's uh, lovely. Uh, she was wonderful. Oh, and, she's brilliant. Uh, and 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 I, I I've recently rewatched uh, This Is England. Um, I watched it before I interviewed Joe, and so mm. and then obviously Helen's done it, and 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 it's great. She getting... was so good. She was everyone was so good, but Helen was um, oh, she was amazing. She was really really good. And I was so chuffed for her for um, a BAFTA nomination for the version. Yeah. I think she deserved that so much. She was brilliant. And I just wanted to ask her, and what you touched upon about getting yourself in an emotional state, um, you know, and then having to kind of then process that when you, you know, you come off set and you go home. She, she sort of touched on that because I asked her, and I'm going to ask you the same question. I, I think... Possibly the greatest piece of television I've ever watched is is that scene in in ninety when you're all sitting around the the, the dinner table. Yeah, uh, I, I think is just one of the most powerful bits of television I've, I've ever mm. witnessed. How was that for you? That scene. It was exhausting. It was absolutely exhausting, and I didn't say a word throughout the whole thing. And it's very much like, well, we shot that in one take. We did one take for that, and it was about. I'm going to say about 45 minutes. So the so Shane and Nikki Salt, who was the first AD on um, 90, they created such a tense atmosphere on set. Nobody was allowed on set. It was only us and the cameraman. And it was very much like these guys... Uh, because it, it we, we was thinking about everything. And, you know, the, 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 the performance that Johnny Harris put in, for you know, for for eighty six and eight, and you know the 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 flashbacks and things for eighty eight and ninety, the performance that that man put in was, I think, one of the best things I've ever seen, and it because I say that because he's one of the most you've he's been on the podcast, hasn't he? He was one of the first people, and he's one of the loveliest men I ever met. It's genuinely like my wife's the same, and Andy Ellis's wife was the same. They couldn't believe how nice he was. <laughs> he doesn't swear, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. He's such, a, he's the most genuine. Some of the messages that Johnny would, you know, he, he sent me a text for my birthday and um, he's just such a sweetheart and, and he, he's so honest to himself and he's so sort of, he's just got the most beautiful soul. Um, so for that performance that he put in for that, you know, we we very much, I personally very took, took myself back to what he did and the pain that he that he, you know, put on to, to Vicky and um, Daniel Watson, who played Trev, and for himself as well, and for Stephen and for Shane and for the crew members who watched it, because I know how difficult that sort of thing is. Uh, well, I don't, obviously, but I, I, you get a real sense of how they felt about the whole thing. Um, and it was very much... Um, it was so real and so raw... Um, yeah, and we sort of because the the take was going on for so long, we very quickly forgot that it was that we was on a film set. You know, we very quickly forgot about the cameras, and seeing Vicky McClure in that state, and you know Joe Gilgan and and Andrew Shim, I think that that scene is one of the best things I think Andrew Shim's ever done. I think he, he's so good in that, um, as is everybody. I just think it just felt so real and so raw um so you know I, I don't want to say that the emotions was easy but they were so natural and we didn't have to think I didn't have to think oh my god I've got a cry here or oh my god I need to say something it was very much just the the, the way Sean felt is, is exactly how I felt and that's why you know in that situation I, I didn't have anything to say so I didn't need to say anything it was very much about everybody else and you know it was just um yeah, I mean, again, I recently rewatched that, and it's um, yeah, it was. Just, I, I think it's yeah, just the emotions that you get from even just from watching it and taking you back to that to what we went through that day was, you know, I, we we had a full day of filming set up for after that, and Shane cut, said cut and just said, "There's no fucking way I'm we can carry on today," and just called the day, and um, yeah, I mean, it was um, yeah, it was it was it was beautiful. It really was beautiful. Last track, Tomo. Mm. 
a song that many may not know that you would like them to hear. So this was, so like a guilty pleasure? It can be, yeah. Right. Um, I mean, any, I'm a big fan of Lewis Capaldi. Okay. I, I mean, really like Lewis Capaldi, but I mean, there's no shame in that. I think he's brilliant. No. Um, and one of the funniest people on the planet. And one of the funniest men ever. <laughs> he's, um, I think he's, he's got a very sort of mainstream audience. Um, and the people who follow my work might not necessarily like his, his, his work. Um, so anything Lewis Capaldi, um, and it sort of happened by accident. Someone had tagged me in a photo going, oh, this Lewis Capaldi guy looks like Thomas Turgoose. And I was like, I didn't really see it at first. But then Lewis, uh, he'd followed me on Instagram and he said, um, do you want to come to a show? So me and Charlotte went to one of his gigs. And I tell you what, I cried my eyes out. Really? I cried my eyes out uh, and it because it was just it was just one man and a guitar and it, that's all that's all he needed. Um and he he sang there's, there's a song called Bruises that he wrote and he performed that and I I turned around and at the top of the I think it's the O2 Academy in Manchester. Um uh oh is it the the Ritz? I think it's the O2 Academy in Manchester. And I turned around and on the balcony, there was the, um, there was the disabled um, seating. And there was a young girl there. She must have been nine or 10. And she was holding onto her mum's hand and she was singing every word to his, to his music. And I, I remember turning around and just seeing how fixated this, this girl was on him and, and his music. And it just, and it, it broke my heart. And it was one of them that I sort of turned around and I was like, and then Charlotte turned around and then the guys next to us turned around and then everyone, and before you know it, everyone was turning around looking at this little girl in a wheelchair singing his music. And it just, it was just, it just broke my heart, but it was also the, one of the most heartwarming things that I've ever seen as well. So yeah, that was, so anything sort of by Lewis Capaldi is very much a, a guilty pleasure of mine. But I, I mean, I never really saw the, the, the similarities between us, but after the gig, we went for a pint and there's a photo of me and Lewis and we've literally got the same face. It's so weird. <laughs> Honestly, it's so strange. And I shit you not, I put the photo on Facebook and it tagged my dad. You know our Facebook tags, so it goes, you, this, you may be in this photo. And I shit you not, it tagged my dad on Facebook. I was like, fucking hell, he's Lewis Capaldi, my dad. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the photo after this. We've, we've got exactly the same face. It's, I know like when we talk, or, or, or when we're, you know, doing videos, obviously facial expressions are different, but on that photo, it's like, I, it confirmed it for me. I thought, fucking hell. I wish I was as funny as him. I think it's <laughs> funny. Have you seen the Graham Norton um, thing where he goes, yeah. that's lots of bums on seats and lots of fucking money in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's brilliant, but you know, I guess a lot, of, a lot of the fans of my work might not necessarily like his. So I guess that's kind of a bit of a, a guilty pleasure. Perfect. Well, Tom, we put together a, a Spotify playlist uh, to accompany the, the podcast so people can go and listen to uh, mm. all, all your choices and the tracks that we've, we've chatted about today, mate. Um, as 2021 is, is picking up speed now, we're recording this at the beginning of Feb, um, with a kind of positive outlook on vaccinations being rolled out and infection mm -hmm. rates dropping. Um, what are you looking forward to personally this year? And what's happening professionally, mate? What am I looking forward to? I mean, I've not missed the pubs as such because I'm not a big drinker as much anymore and more so now because of the lockdown. I was very lucky that I never drink at home. I'm one of them that I don't sit at home and have a beer watching EastEnders. It's not, I've never done that. So it's very rare. I mean, I could probably count on, on my hands how many times I've been pissed since March last year through lockdown. Um so I've not missed the pubs. I've missed my friends. I've missed going out for a cup of tea with my mates or, or even just a pint or, or some pub grub. So I'm very much looking forward to being able to go around to my friends and, and sort of, you know, see the kids and hug my family, my little brother, my nieces and nephews and things like that. So that's, that's the main thing that I'm looking forward to. Um, hopefully I start filming on a job in May. Um, obviously I can't say what that is, um, which is very exciting. Um, but also nerve wracking. And it's kind of weird because 
whenever you land a job, you should feel excited and you should be buzzing. Whereas now, because this has come in and because of everything that's going on, and I really have become a bit of a hermit. So I'm a bit like, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about going to work and having the COVID test two day, two or three times a week. I'm a bit, I'm, I'm more nervous than excited, which is a very strange sort of feeling. Um, so I'm very, very much looking forward to sort of getting that first week out of the way and getting back to very much to, to normality. Um, I made a film two years ago called Creation Stories, which is mm. based on um, Alan McGee's legacy, um, who obviously is famous for finding Oasis and uh, Primal Scream and, you know, many other great bands. Um, and it was just an all round fucking nutter. Um, so yeah, that was good fun. That, that was uh, that up there with some of my favorite, you know, I got to party like I was, you know, hanging around with Alan McGee, which I think a lot of us would like to do having watched. And, and My- Michael's in that as well, right? Michael Socker's in that. Yeah. yeah. That's the first job we'd done away from This Is England. And we had big a- wigs and glasses and things like that. It's brilliant. I've seen a picture. You look great. And, oh, uh, yeah. and so did, did you get to meet Alan? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's kind of weird because Alan, Alan's become a good friend of mine. And it's so strange because... I think one of the best things I've ever watched is the, the Supersonic documentary. It's amazing, uh, isn't it? It's one of the best things. I, can't, I couldn't tell you how many times I've seen it. And and then when I got told about Creation Stories, I was like, fuck me, I'm excited about this. And then Alan was on set. And uh, it's a funny story, actually, because Alan, he, he said he'd seen this as England, but didn't recognise me because I had my all, the, all my, my get up on. And I'd gone up to him and I said, oh, Alan, I said, I'm, I'm Thomas. Nice to meet you. I said, thanks for having me as part of the, you know, your story. And uh, he said he walked away from that conversation and he, and he Googled my name and he was like, he didn't know if I'd like not won a competition, but he was like, oh, this, this, this guy's like done well to be here. Like, who is he? Because he'd obviously not seen me in all my get up. Then he Googled me and went on my Instagram and seen that, you know, I've got a, I like to think a good body of work and, and re, you know, respectable work. So, and Alan was kind of like, oh, fucking hell. Yeah, that's that, the, the young kid from This Is England. He's in this, is he? So it was kind of like, so that from then on, me and Alan, we, we always have a good laugh. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, that's exciting, man. And it's such a good film as well. Such when, a good film. I've still not seen a trailer yet. No, yeah. So it's Alan. Um, Alan texted me the other day and said that, that we're allowed to say now it's going to be out in Sky, on Sky Cinema um, on March the twentieth. Um, for obvious reasons, there's not going to be a cinema release straight away. Whether they, you know, pick that back up, I don't yeah. know. Um, but I mean, people are going to fucking love it. It's so good. Wait. Honestly, me wait. and Charlotte, we we managed to get a little uh, screening of it last year. Last year, yeah, it was maybe last year. Um, and we went to London and watched it and the soundtrack's mint and the, it's so fast paced and funny. And it's, I think people are going to really, really enjoy it. I, we loved it. And it's very rare that Charlotte enjoys any films, let alone some of my films. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if we get Charlotte's, um, if we get Charlotte's blessing, I think we're all right. Wonderful. Tom, yeah. it's been a proper joy chatting to you, mate. Yeah. I've loved it, mate. It's been good. I'm glad we finally got to do it. Oh, wicked. Mate, I wish you all the best uh, for, for, for creation stories and, and the project in May. And uh, and as soon as this is done and dusted and, and you're next down in London, then I'll, I'll hit you up and I'll buy you a beer, man. Yeah, nice one, mate. Nice one. I appreciate it. Lovely. Cheers, Thanks, mate. mate. No worries. Right, I've just pressed stop on there, Tomo, mm-hmm. and 